distort expression <coughs> of these types of simple threat associations. When we, um, when we have extinction learning, the amygdala plays a role in initial extinction learning, but the ventral middle prefrontal cortex is necessary for learning of extinction and the retrieval of extinction. So if you damage this region, uh, rodents will have difficulty learning, but, that, but then when they finally do learn, they'll see the next day, it's almost as like they learned nothing. Um, and essentially what we think that the, the Benjamin prefrontal cortex is doing is inhibiting the amygdala and the expression of the original threat memory, allowing the expression of the extinction memory, this, the memory that this is now safe. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the hippocampus, but we know that's important in telling you where you should express the threat memory versus the safe memory. Um, but our initial, st our initial study, we tried to find evidence for the involvement of these two regions in extinction learning in humans. So we looked in the amygdala, plotted here. Here, I've just pulled the data from the amygdala and plotting it right here. In red, you see the response in the amygdala when you see the blue square during acquisition, um, and this increase in both signal that we expect. And during extinction, we see a slight decrease in both signal, suggesting there's an inhibition of the amygdala. And it's this, this differential response uh, predicts the rate of extinction on the first day across individuals. In the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, here I'm using bar graphs to show you what's going on here in this particular region. Um, this, is, this is consistent with the infralimbic cortex in rodents that we know is involved in the inhibition of the amygdala. We see this decrease in bold signal in this region that, that increases with extinction. So if I took a rodent and I stuck an electrode into this region, I'd see as extinction learning progressed, I see an increase in firing rate in this region, I see a similar pattern here, an increase in signal in this region uh, in the ventral reproductive cortex. And this differential response predicted whether or not somebody re was able to retain extinction learning the second day. So that initial study let us know that the mechanisms, the brain mechanisms of extinction seem to be similar across species, not surprisingly really. But then of course we were interested in saying, how does this extend to how are these brain systems involved in the types of techniques that might be more unique to humans. Uh, and here we're talking about you know, emotional regulation, using your thoughts to change your emotions. And I put this up here just because you know, this is sort of the classic example. You can think of the glass as half full or half empty. That might create a different, different emotional reaction in you. This is essentially what we mean by cognitive emotion regulation. Teaching somebody who's thinking of the glass as half empty that, to think of it as half full. Um, and in this particular study, um, you know, we, we would ask participants to reevaluate a stimulus with negative affect into neutral or positive emotional terms. And the way we did this, using this simple type of threat learning procedures uh, that, we did our, that we've been uh, using in our previous studies, is participants again saw two stimuli, one paired with shock, another never paired with shock. Immediately prior to seeing the stimulus, they saw either the word attend, in which case they were told you should just focus on your natural feelings. Or they saw the word regulate. And when they saw the word regulate, they were told to use the color of the square to come up with an image from nature that was calming to them. Um, and we didn't tell them what this image should be. Is this school outside school class or something? Yeah. Uh, we didn't tell them what this image should be. They practiced ahead of time generating this image so they could do it easily on command when they saw the, the, the cue regulate. So if it was a blue square, it could be you know, a, a beautiful water scene, a yellow square, a field of daisies, daisies, whatever was calming to them. So they were able to, so participants were able to use this strategy to reduce their, um, their autonomic arousal, their physiological arousal response uh, to the stimulus paired with shock. So here I've plotted in blue the <laughs> stimulus that was paired with shock, in yellow the control stimulus never paired with shock. And what you can see, um, is that participants were able to reduce um, their arousal response when using the regulate strategy. When we looked in the brain in the amygdala, we saw, again, uh, similar to what we saw in extinction. So here is our extinction data I showed you previously. Here's when they're acquiring the threat reaction, uh, and here's when they're extinguishing it. Here's where participants are attending to the emotional significance of the stimulus of shock. And here's where they're regulating it. So a very similar pattern. 
When we looked in the prefrontal cortex, we saw two regions that showed greater brain activity, uh, greater bold activity when participants were regulating as compared to attending to the emotional significance uh, of the stimulus. Um, one was the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is a region that's often seen in studies of cognitive emotion regulation. It's thought to be involved in the, the executive control, the online manipulation of the interpretation of the meaning of the stimulus. And this is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is similar to the region uh, that we observed in uh, extinction. If I looked at this region of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex um, from the extinction data set, and I looked at both extinction and emotion regulation, what I see is a very similar pattern. So again, we have this decrease in bold signal here when we, when we experience a threat that increases as we extinguish our threat reaction or regulate, use a cognitive strategy to regulate um, our emotional response. So this suggests to us, um, oh, and I should say, and if I use this region and I look to say what brain regions are connected with this region when you're regulating um, your emotional response, I find the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So this suggests to us a circuit where we know the amygdala is important for the acquisition, storage, and expression of these, type, of these simple threat memories. We know the ventral medial prefrontal cortex plays a role in inhibiting the expression of those threat memories to allow the expression of a, of a distinction memory or a memory that this is now safe. And we think that the same circuitry that we know is conserved across species is also necessary by signals from the, from the dorsal prefrontal cortex when you now use your thoughts to reinterpret things to, um, to, uh, to, to, think, to, to change your emotional reaction. So in other words, thinking about things differently so they're no longer threatening. So much like in fear acquisition, we think that, the, we, that humans take advantage of this phylogenetically older system of threat control to use our thoughts to, to change our emotions. Uh, and this was worked by Mauricio Delgado in my lab, who's now a professor of records. So these two techniques are used in the clinic now. Uh, extinction uh, is, is akin to exposure therapy, a cognitive re regulation akin to cognitive therapy. And they are successful, um, but not as successful as we'd like. Uh, there are many individuals that they don't, very, they don't work with very well. Um, and even in, for individuals where they have been successful, we often see um, at later times a return of the maladaptive uh, fear or threat reactions. Um, and we know, following extinction and emotion regulation, fear and threat response is susceptible to relapse following the passage of time, all the spontaneous recovery, context shift being in a different place than when you learn these techniques, and also just getting, being re-exposed to the aversive stimulus. Um, another circumstance for any of you who are, you know, who, who, uh, who have a habit or that you don't want that you're trying to get rid of or who may be anxious at certain times about certain things, another circumstance that sometimes shows uh, evidence of a relapse um, that leads to, leads to a relapse may be stress. Um, so now here when I'm talking about fear and threat, I'm talking about responses to specific stimuli. Stress is a general response that we have in humans. Um, we're finding, in, in, in Americans I should say, that we're finding that, uh, that the level of stress that people report on a day-to-day -day basis just in their everyday life is increasing. And all of you know that if you're trying to diet or if you're trying to um, keep your emotions in check, being stressed doesn't help. Um, and I just put this up here. There's a, the American Psychological Association does a stress in America survey. Uh, and what they show is that most Americans report experiencing moderate to severe stress in the last month. And they've shown that the incidence of reports of moderate to severe stress are increasing over the last five years. So this is becoming sort of an epidemic in our lives. Um, and the question is, uh, how does stress impact our ability to use these techniques, uh, like extinction or exposure therapy, or uh, emotion regulation or cognitive therapy? Um, and one of the reasons why we think it would uh, impair our ability to use those types of techniques is because we know that those uh, 
that those techniques we rely, rely on the prefrontal cortex to inhibit the amygdala. And although stress has, has varied effects on the brain, one of the most robust effects it has on the brain is that it impairs prefrontal cortex function. Um, and this is a slide I borrowed from Amy Arnstein. Um, and so what, you know, we know that you know, depending on the level of stress, you, you can show various responses in different brain regions, but even mild stress impairs prefrontal cortex function, impairs our ability to, uh, which, which should impair our ability to inhibit uh, our emotional responses. Um, so we wanted to ask the question, does stress impair the inhibition of stress responses? Um, and we've done this with both extinction and emotion regulation, um, but I'm gonna talk about our study with emotion regulation. Um, so in this particular study, um, we had participants again come into the laboratory. One stimulus was paired with shock, another was not paired with shock. Um, and this is a slightly different technique because we actually worked with a clinical psychologist who does cognitive therapy to come up with um, uh, a manipulation that's more akin to what you might do in the clinic. Um, so after this simple threat learning procedure, participants underwent what we call a cognitive restructuring uh, therapy session. They were shown these stimuli. We asked them to, uh, to ask, we asked them what their emotions are about the stimuli and rate the intensity of those emotions. They were then instructed about the relationship between thoughts and emotion and shown little cartoons like this that show, you know, how, how you interpret the same, you know, stimuli can change your emotional reactions. And, and then we said, okay, tomorrow you're coming back to the laboratory. You're going to do the exact same thing you did today. How are you going to think about things differently tomorrow to change your emotional reactions? And so participants came up with a number of strategies. Um, so they could think about the fact that the probability of shock was low, because only about a third of the trials were paired with shock. Um, that there's, that, you know, there's no uncertainty about what's going to happen in the next day. That the shock is really at the end of the picture, it's not the picture itself. Um, so they could come up with whatever strategies they thought they could use to help reduce their, um, their negative reaction to the, the, the stimulus uh, on the next day, the stimulus paper shock. The next day participants came back and we induced a stress response. Um, we did this by <coughs> sticking their hand in freezing water for three minutes. I know in my lab it sounds a little strange. Um, this is actually a very reliable way to induce uh, a cortisol re response and HPA axis activation typical of a stress response. It's not the best psychological manipulation to do this. The best uh, manipulation to use in a psychology lab to use a stress reaction is to ask someone to give a public presentation and look disapproving. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. Um, but that leads to social rejection and worry and things. We don't want to do that. So, um, so we stuck their hand in freezing water. So half the participants came in uh, but they, they had put their hand in freezing water for three minutes. The other half participants came in uh, and they put their hand in room temperature water. We measured cortisol throughout the study to look for um, evidence of a stress response. Uh, and following this manipulation, they did the same conditioning procedure they did the day before. So here on, this, on the left, I've plotted um, the cortisol response prior to the stressor manipulation, and then following, uh, subtracting out the, the, the following the entire experiment. And what you can see in the no stress group, the group that stuck their hand into room temperature water, we saw no, see no increase in cortisol. Whereas in the group that stuck their hand in, in freezing water for three minutes, we see what we predicted, which is increase in cortisol response consistent with a acute stress reaction. Here I've plotted the difference in the response from, to the stimulus paired with shock, the, this is the, again the skin conductance response, the stimulus paired with shock, um, from the first day to the second day. So what is the proportion decrease in the conditioned response? So here in the no stress group, they were able to use this type of training, this restructuring technique, to diminish their conditioned response, their threat reaction, the second day. Whereas in the stress group, even though they felt like they were using these techniques as, as well as they could, showed no evidence of success in using these techniques to reduce their physiological threat reaction. Interestingly, this also extended to their ratings of the stimuli, their subjective feelings. Um, the no stress group reported less emotional intensity uh, and sort of less fear and anxiety related responses the second day, whereas the stress group showed no change the second day. 
So this tells us that even relatively mild stress, sticking your hand in freezing water for three minutes, can impair your ability to use these types of cognitive strategies um, that we're currently uh, using in the clinic in cognitive therapy. Um, and we think, you know, this is work by Candice Rayo in my lab, who's now a postdoc at NYU. Um, and we think that, you know, that this happens because we know that stress, even mild stress, can impair prefrontal cortex function. And of course, these techniques require the prefrontal cortex to inhibit the amygdala. Um, so we have stress impairs extinction recall. I didn't present that data, but we showed that as well. And emotion regulation, perhaps by altering prefrontal cortex function. So this, of course, begs the question, if these techniques, uh, although successful, but can be sort of temporary, especially when individuals are stressed, when people most likely need to be able to inhibit their, their threat reactions, um, their fears and their worries, um, maybe we should be looking for other techniques as well. Um, so that's really what I'm going to spend the rest of the time today talking about. I want to talk about three different techniques that have not yet been translated to the clinic uh, that we're, we're looking at and trying to develop to see if we can find better ways to more persistently control um, threat, re threat reactions when they're no longer adaptive, when the situation is messy. So again, um, you know, these techniques are set with relapse. We think this is reflected clinically in the relapse rate following exposure and or cognitive therapy. And we want to find more, uh, we want to find techniques that can result in more persistent control of threat. And the first one I'm going to talk about is by targeting memory reconsolidation. So let me first introduce to you what we mean by reconsolidation. So this is sort of the typical view of how memory works. You learn something. Uh, and then the memory undergoes what we call consolidation. This is a storage process that takes time, even though you're not doing anything, you're not thinking about what happened, your memory is actively working to make the synaptic changes that become that memory. So if you were to do something immediately after learning um, that would disrupt the, these synaptic changes, such as introducing a protein synthesis inhibitor, this protein synthesis is necessary for the synaptic changes, you then would essentially block the storage of the memory. So consolidation is an active process that takes time um, that leads to memory storage. Traditionally, it's been thought that once a memory is stored, once it's consolidated, it's in your mind, um, you're in your brain, and you, when you retrieve that memory, you essentially um, you know, come up with that, that initial memory. But when you retrieve it a second time, you come up with that initial memory again. It's almost like once it's stored, it's in a file, and you pull it out, put it back in the file pull it out, it's back in the file. Um, so, and this has been the this primary view of how memory works uh, for the last you know, 100 years or so. And about a, a couple decades ago, there was a renewed interest in this other view of how memory works. This other view suggests you learn something, there's a consolidation period where the synaptic changes that become that memory occur, um, and it's stored. Then you, when you retrieve the memory, there's yet another consolidation period, another period of synaptic changes that have to take place so that memory now gets restored uh, and then, of course, to be re-retrieved. Um, and this, was, this idea is very exciting for clinical purposes because it, it suggests that when you learn something, you know, it's not that that memory now is there forever and all you can do is inhibit it. Perhaps if we can disrupt this restorage process, we can now find a way to change even an older memory um, that may be problematic for you. And so the evidence for this, um, this, has been, you know, this idea had been around for quite a while, uh, but there was no, really no good evidence for reconsolidation mechanisms until about the year 2000, when Craig Mader, who was a postdoc in Joe Ledoux's lab, did a study like this. He brought rats into the lab. He paired a tone with um, a, a foot chop. So they learned this sort of threat association. He waited a day for that uh, threat memory to store and consolidate. He brought the rats back a day later. He played that tone. He then injected into the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, which is the site, we, uh, the, the site where we know these connections, these, these memories are stored, um, a protein synthesis inhibitor. Protein synthesis is necessary for synaptic changes that occurred during reconsolidation. So by inhibiting protein synthesis, 
We're essentially inhibiting the reformation of that memory. Um, and then he brought the rodents back a day later. He played the tone, and it looked like the rodents um, never experienced the tone pair was shot. They acted as if it was a new tone. So this was really exciting. Um, Joe Ledoux, this is in Joe Ledoux's lab. Joe and I have been collaborating for 20 years, sort of going between rodents and humans. Um, and so we really wanted to try this in people. There was a problem, of course. We can't do this in people. Um, we're not allowed to inject proteases inhibitors into the amygdals of humans. Um, so we had to find another way to, to do this um, by targeting this memory storage process. Um, and so we thought about, you know, what is the purpose of reconsolidation? Why would it be the case when you learn something? Um, why would it be the case that when you learn something and then retrieve it, the memory once again becomes fragile? The memory once again uh, is susceptible to change. And one possible reason for this is that we know memory is dynamic. It changes over time. Um, and the information available at the time you retrieve a memory may be relevant for the use of that memory in the future, which of course is to promote adaptive behavior in the future. So perhaps it's best you know, that we have this dynamic nature of memory so that we can incorporate new information into older memories uh, to allow all that information to be stored together, together for future use. Um, so this is essentially um, a mechanism for the dynamic nature of memory and the idea that memory is constantly being updated. Uh, and so we asked the question, can we then update the memory of a threat association with new information about the value uh, of the stimulus that is threatening. And to do this, we did a simple procedure like this. So we did several studies like this. This is one. So participants came to the laboratory. We had one stimulus, uh, two stimuli that were paired with shots. One I'm going to call the CS plus R for reconsolidation. One the CS plus E for extinction. And again, one stimulus never paired with shots. We then brought participants back a day later. We waited for this memory to consolidate. We reminded them of one of the stimulus, the reconsolidation stimulus. Um, and this reminder is essentially to reactivate the memory to then, then allow us, the, reactivate the memory to start the reconsolidation <coughs> process to allow us to update that memory. We had this 10 minute break, uh, and this is sort of a necessary thing to essentially trigger the reconsolidation process and we can talk about why the 10 minute break afterwards, if you'd like. Um, and then participants underwent what we called safety training, which is essentially identical to extinction. They're now seeing all these stimuli again. They're not getting any shocks. They're learning that these stimuli are safe. So the only difference between this CS plus R and E, right, is that the reconsolidation CS, they're getting the safety training during the restorage process of this memory because they had the reactivation and the reminder. The reactivation, the, the CS plus E or the extinction stimulus, they're going under, undergoing standard extinction, which we know uh, results in a second memory trace that then competes with the first for expression. We then brought participants back a day later. We gave them some shocks to essentially reinstate the threat memory. And then we looked to see, did they show evidence of uh, recovery of the threat reactions to both of these stimuli? So this is, here I'm plotting um, the skin conductance response to, to the three stimuli, the two paired with shock and the one not paired with shock. This is the end of acquisition, so when the stimulus is paired with shock on a, on a portion of the trials, so what you can see is participants show an increased arousal response to the stimuli paired with shock. This is the end of extinction or safety training, and what you can see is that it's successful at reducing the um, defensive response to the stimuli, uh, extinction or safety training. This is the first few trials of the third day. Um, and what you see is, much like I showed you in the very first uh, slide of, of conditioning and extinction, is that we see robust evidence of recovery uh, of the threat response to the stimulus that underwent standard extinction training. No evidence of recovery to the stimulus that underwent extinction during reconsolidation, or safety training during reconsolidation. And I should say, we, we then did a second extinction session. Participants left the lab, um, essentially showing no threat reaction to these stimuli. We then brought some participants in a different study back a year later. Once again, we could give some shocks. 
reinstate, show evidence of recovery of the threat reaction for the stimulus that underwent standard extinction, uh, but no evidence of recovery for the stimulus that underwent uh, safety training during the reconsolidation uh, window. So this was very exciting to us. We then went to the scanner and said, okay, what's the difference in the brain between essentially the same procedure, but one has a 10 minute or nine minute, and the other does not, between showing, doing safety training during reconsolidation versus standard extinction training. And when we compare these two stimuli, the only region that shows a difference is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, this region that we know is important in inhibiting the amygdala in extinction learning. And essentially here what I've plotted is the difference uh, in signal in this region from uh, late to early extinction. So again, responses in this region increase with extinction training. We see that for the stimuli that's undergoing extinction training. We don't see any differential response in this region for the stimulus that underwent extinction during reconsolidation or, this, or the stimulus uh, that was never paired with shock. Um, and so in a way, we think what we might have done is we no longer need to inhibit the amygdala uh, to allow the expression of safety memory Perhaps we've actually changed the representation of the memory in the amygdala, um, so it doesn't require inhibition. And one more point supporting that is when we then say, what's the connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex during extinction versus safety training during reconsolidation? We said much. We showed a strong connectivity during extinction <coughs> that is not there when we are, we think, updating the memory with new information about the value of the stimulus. Um, so this was really exciting to us. Um, again, our interpretation here is that we're essentially rewriting the original memory um, so it no longer exists in its original form. Um, you know, this would require plasticity in the amygdala. <coughs> we can't study plasticity related changes in the amygdala in humans. Uh, but this work was in collaboration with Marie Monfils, who was a postdoc with Joe Ledoux, and she was able to show with this simple reminder procedure, you do see plasticity related changes in the amygdala, again, consistent with the idea that what we're actually doing now is not inhibiting the amygdala, but essentially changing the memory itself. So, you know, this has been, this was hugely exciting to us and others uh, at the time, a simple behavioral intervention that's targeted to a particular stage of memory formation. Um, we can actually then perhaps uh, find ways to permanently alter threat reactions. Uh, and of course, the first thing you want to try to do is say, does this work in the clinic? Um, and I have to say, this was the, our first study on this was published uh, in 2010. Um, and since that time, there's been limited evidence that targeting reconsolidation has been successful uh, in reducing clinical symptoms for fear-related <coughs> disorders. So there's a number of studies published here. A lot of people have tried. The first real success was actually with drug addiction. Um, there was a group in China that used exposure therapy to try to reduce craving in drug addicts. And what they did with standard exposure therapy was they do a reminder 10 minutes before the, before the exposure therapy session, and they showed, uh, they showed more effective reduction in craving. In fear-related disorders, anxiety disorders, um, phobias, PTSD, success has not been as great. There's been some evidence that these techniques are good at reducing um, physiological responses, but not necessarily clinical symptoms. Um, and so we're still working on it. But part of the reason why um, we think success has now has been somewhat limited in the clinic and you in translating the, these techniques of the clinic is that um, animal models and human research since our initial studies have shown some what we call boundary conditions that limit the success of reconsolidation um, one of them is you know the age of memory for that it might be harder for older memories one's the strength of memory for stronger memories and the other one is generalization of the memory and i want to just talk about this for just a second um, I'm showing you examples of learning where you have one stimulus that leads to a threat reaction and another stimulus that does not. Um, a classic symptom, and, and that, that's really an adaptive response, right? That stimulus does predict a threat. Um, a classic symptom of anxiety disorders is that threats are more generalized. You, know, you might learn something bad about one thing, but now you extend it to other situations. So just to give you an example, if you were confronted with a dog like this and you, and you had a threat reaction, um, it might be normal the next time you see this dog to be afraid and to sweat a little bit and have your heart rates. But maybe not if you see this dog, right? And generalization of threat reactions is sort of a classic symbol of anxiety disorders. It's normal to have threat reactions of things that are threatening, but 
when they go beyond situations where they're threatening, where you're actually safe and you're still having that reaction, that's, that's, that is essentially the definition of an anxiety disorder. Um, and we can study this in humans, this generalization of threat reactions by doing something like this, so we can give certain frequencies, one of them paired with shock, um, and we would normally expect if this, if this hurts tone, or this frequency, this tone was paired with shock, you would expect to see uh, a, uh, a conditioned response of some sort to this tone, but not to other tones. If you start to show the same response to other tones, then you have some generalization of threat reactions. And patients with anxiety disorders and these simple type of learning procedures tend to show more, more generalization. In addition, there's some evidence that you show more generalization if the aversive event itself, the, in this case the shock, is more intense. Um, and so we wanted to ask the question in humans, is it the case that more intense uh, aversive events lead to greater threat generalization? Uh, and then ask the question, what is that, well, how does that impact the ability to target memories with reconsolidation? So in humans, we are limited in what we can do um, in terms of uh, presenting aversive stimuli in the laboratory. We present mild shocks for the wrist. Again, we ask participants to tell us for those shocks, are they uncomfortable but not painful? Um, so you know, for ethical reasons, we can't do more, but we do our best. So we do something like this. Um, so again, so now we're trying to say, what can we get a high intensity, a more aversive event, and will it lead to more threat generalization? So some participants came in, and there they got a shock of what they call highly unpleasant. We can, we essentially, through the, everything we can, this is like the worst we can do to somebody. That and stick their hand in raising water, or ask them to give a talk. Um, we, uh, they, we gave them a shock, but they, they described it as highly unpleasant but not painful. We paired that with a loud noise and a picture of a snake coming at them. The other participants who got the low intensity uh, manipulation just had a shock that was mildly unpleasant. We then brought participants in, they heard one tone paired with our aversive stimulus, either the high intensity or the low intensity, another tone never paired with the aversive stimulus. So here I'm plotting the skin conductance response uh, to the stimulus paired with shock. So here, this is, this is when they learn the threat reaction. Okay, so here is the stimulus paired with shock. Here's the stimulus not paired with shock. We see this differential response consistent with a conditioned response. It doesn't matter about the intensity. You can learn uh, about the threat reaction with low intensity or high intensity stimuli. But now we're doing a test of all the tones in between. And what you see in this test is that if you have a high intensity stimulus, you now have uh, generalization to other stimuli that are related, right? Um, and this, of course, you know, if we are talking about an event in the real world that leads to a persistent um, stress reaction, a persistent threat reaction, we're talking about something generally that's high intensity. Um, and so when we use this paradigm, and I'm going to show you the data, to then try to target a memory with reconsolidation using the technique I described earlier, we were unsuccessful. Um, perhaps because the memory is not very precise. This high, intensity, uh, uh, this high intensity event led to a generalized memory, and it was harder than to have one stimulus that reminded participants of the memory enough to target the reconsolidation process. Um, and this is work by Joey Dunsmore, who's now a professor at UT Austin. So you know, there are several boundary conditions to targeting reconsolidation to try to uh, control threat reactions. We, one of them being that increased threat generalization of traumatic events may make it difficult to target specific threat memories of reactivation. Um, and so we're, we haven't given up on trying to, using reconsolidation techniques, uh, to try to find ways to translate to the clinic to target more complex memories. Um, we're still working on ways to overcome these boundary conditions. Um, but we, what we started doing in the lab is also say, are there other techniques where we can more effectively control maladaptive threat reactions. So I'm going to finish today by talking about two things that we're studying right now, two new techniques that we we're looking at to see are these going to be more effective at controlling maladaptive threat reactions, at controlling uh, your threat reactions when the stimulus is now really sick. Uh, and the first is looking at stressor control mobility, and the second we call novelty facilitating stimulus. So stressor control ability is really based on um, 
a literature uh, from research in non-humans that started in the 60s on learned helplessness. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of learned helplessness, um, this was really what they would do, is, it was dogs primarily in the, in the beginning. They would give dogs um, lots of shocks. The dogs could do nothing about the shocks. Um, and then they found later on that the dogs appear unmotivated to try to do anything. Right? The dog sort of had this uncontrollable threat, stress, uh, uncontrollable stressor, lots of, lots of shock, couldn't avoid them no matter what they did. Then they wouldn't even try to avoid them when they could avoid them. Or they seemed to be more, more less socially interactive. Um, and, and this often became a model of sort of depression and anxiety, this sort of learned helplessness. Um, what people don't often know is that there was a flip side to this literature. So, that was, so those dogs were compared to dogs that never had the, the shocks at all. But later on, research from rodents showed that if you now also had rodents that had the ability to control the shock, right? So they were given they were given the shock, but they had the opportunity to do to take an action to avoid the shocks, and they could learn to do this. They actually showed somewhat better responding uh, in future stressful circumstances than than um, than rodents that actually never got shocks at all. Just to give you an example of this, so here's the no stress group, the rod rodents that never got shocks. Here are, the, here are the rodents that got shocks that they couldn't do anything about, the learned helplessness group. And here's the rodents who got shocks that they could learn to avoid. Um, and this literature, which is now quite extensive literature in, in non-humans, in animals, um, shows that relative to rodents that never got shocks, rodents that, you know, could, that could never avoid a shock freeze more, show more social defeat, but relative to rodents that actually never got shocks, rodents that could got shocks but could learn to avoid them show less freezing and less social defeat. Similarly, um, relative to rodents that never got shocked, those who had learned who got shocked and couldn't avoid them showed less avoidance learning, less social exploration. But relative to rodents that never got shocked, those that could learn to avoid the shock and still got them but could learn to avoid them would show better avoidance learning and more social exploration going forward. Um, so there's this benefit of learning that you have control, even in the future, extending to a number of different behaviors. So we want to ask the question in humans, do experiences of control modulate subsequent threat expression uh, in humans? So to do this, um, we have participants come to the laboratory. Um, we gave them a little task like this. We showed them this grid. We said you can use the arrow keys to explore different <coughs> actions. They would get a, a, a mild shock to the wrist every two seconds. This grid was on until they learned to uh, to move this red dot to the other side of the of the screen. So this manipulation, um, there were three groups. One was able to learn to avoid the shocks. There was another group that came in. They got shocks. They were also allowed to move around. But how many shocks they got was, had nothing to do with their actions. They got the same number of shocks as somebody uh, in the escapable group. Right? So the number of shocks was equivalent. And then there was one group that never underwent this procedure. A week later, we brought them back into the laboratory. And we did our standard threat conditioning procedure. One stimulus pair of shock, another one never pair of shock. Um, followed by extinction learning. Followed by 24 hours later, a test of extinction recall did we see recovery, did we see re persistent control of the threat reaction after extinction learning. So here's the end of acquisition. So here I'm plotting the differential response to the stimulus paired with shock relative to the one that was never paired with shock. This is again skin conductant. Um, at the, and what we see is, you know, having this escapable shock doesn't impair your ability to learn about threatening stimuli. You learn normally when something's actually threatening. But when that stimulus is no longer threatening, you extinguish a little bit faster than participants that never got shocks, which is also a little bit faster than those who got shocks they couldn't escape. And when we come back a day later, this safety loader, extinction learning, you show lots and lots of threat recovery, so again, in spite of the station learning, you now are showing robust evidence that you still have threat reactions. If you got shocks, you could never escape. Some evidence of return of the threat reaction for the group that never got shocks a week earlier. 
and then no evidence of threat recovery for the group that was able to learn to avoid shocks. We also saw that, you know, so, in, so, so individuals in the first session, those who could avoid shocks, and even though some of those who couldn't avoid the shocks, varied in how much they felt like they had the ability to control the, sh the presentation of the shocks. Um, so interestingly, participants who could avoid the shocks and thought they could avoid the shocks, so some of them, even though they were able to avoid them, didn't feel like they had control. If you both were able to and um, felt like you did, you showed le less evidence of threat reactions a week later. Um, this wasn't true if you felt like you'd avoid shocks, but you actually couldn't. So you had to both be able to do it and think that you could do it. And individuals who showed essentially what we call a, 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 ternal, a, a higher internal locus of control, this is just a sort of a personality questionnaire about like how much do you think you can control your environment. Individuals that showed a higher internal locus of control were better at just learning to avoid the shocks to begin with. Um, so this suggests to us that you know sort of how much you have control and how much you feel like you have control uh, can, can uh, have a lasting effect on threat reactions and also learning when something is safe that it's really safe going forward. Um, and so I'm going to show you a cartoon version of the neurocircuitry that we think is involved in the sort of lasting effect of control on future threat reactions. And this is work, um, with this work primarily by Justin Mascarello and also some work um, by Stephen Mayer's group. And essentially, this is the amygdala. Um, and when we talk about the amygdala in non-humans, we talk about different sub-regions of the amygdala, the lateral nucleus here is, is where we know these sort of associations are formed between a neutral stimulus and a shock. Um, when you now have your standard defensive responses, your physiological responses, what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about here, we know the lateral nucleus projects to the central nucleus that projects to the brainstem and the, the hypothalamus that leads to the physiological threat reactions that we're discussing. However, when you now have the opportunity to avoid a shock, the lateral nucleus projects to the basal nucleus, which projects to the striatum, which leads to the avoidance reaction. And when you have, you know, sort of the opportunity to do to either avoid or not avoid, we, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex sort of toggles between the, the between, you know, which one of these circuitries are you expressing? Are you expressing avoidance circuitry, or are you expressed the defensive response? Um, and when we do this controllability training. What we find is there's plasticity-related changes in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex that, that, that uh, have the, the impact of signaling the amygdala to view the situation as controllable, as something that I can do something about as not, even when there isn't control in the future going forward. So essentially, you know, without the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, we wouldn't see the lasting effects of control uh, on, um, on future threat reactions. And so essentially this mechanism works by augmenting this ventral medial prefrontal cortex amygdala circuitry. And in humans, we've done similar work um, with avoidance uh, and showed um, involvement of simil a similar neural circuitry. Uh, and this was work by, again, Justin Mascarello and rodents, Kate Hartley and Emily Buga uh, in my lab. Where Kate's now a professor at NYU. Justin is now a professor at UT. Oh, gee, I forget which UT it is. Um, and Emily is actually still a graduate student in my life. So the last technique I want to talk about today um, is essentially something that we discovered by accident, to be honest, um, full disclosure. Um, but it is based on the principle of this, that one of the things about extinction learning, when you, once you learn something's a threat to you and now you're shown that this thing is safe, don't worry about it, is, it, is that you know, you, there's a lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty you know, what's going on? How, why does the world change? Why is this thing safe? Should I be worried about it? Should I not be worried about it? And that uncertainty heart makes it hard to learn, you know, that this thing really is safe, right? That there is, it's really not a good thing to have this threat reaction anymore. Um, and we thought that by, perhaps by reducing this uncertainty, by introducing a neutral stimulus in place of the unconditioned stimulus, by essentially, you know, making it now, it's just predicting something that's neutral, we actually might be able to reduce this recovery of threat rea reactions that we see after safety learning. Um, and just to lend some support to the idea that uncertainty may be one of the reasons why safety learning is so fragile, here I've plotted, so this is just um, a, a data set looking at um, 
threat conditioning, and then this threat recovery stage, sort of the last day of, of the, or, or the last day of the procedure, where I say, did the threat response come back after extinction learning? Um, and plotting sort of how much recovery you have, both in spontaneous recovery, just the passage of time, or reinstatement, where I interview you to do shocks, um, related to how, what's your sort of intolerance of uncertainty. So intolerance of uncertainty is essentially a personality scale. Some people report um, a better ability to, talk, to deal with uncertainty in the world than other people. So individuals that have a higher intolerance of uncertainty show more evidence of threat recovery um, with these different measures. So the way this procedure worked, we call it novelty facilitated extinction, is participants came to the laboratory. Again, one stimulus was paired with shock, another never paired with shock. We then uh, divided the participants into two groups. One group underwent standard extinction training. Again, no shocks were presented. The other group, the only difference is they heard a, a, a neutral tone at the time when they would have gotten the shock previously. We then brought participants back a day later and presented the stimuli again to look to see did, the, um, did they show recovery of the threat reaction or did they show persistent threat control that lasted beyond a day. Uh, and in this day, there were no tones presented for both groups. So here I've plotted the sort of the differential response between the stimulus paired with shock and the one not paired with shock. So this is our conditioned response. This is the end of acquisition. Um, so again, both groups could show, could learn the threat reactions. This is the end of extinction learning, so both groups <coughs> diminished their, their response, their conditioned response at the end of extinction. And this is uh, the first few trials of the recovery test. So what we see is what we expect in the extinction group, evidence that the threat reaction returns, um, even though they've learned it's safe, but no evidence of recovery uh, in the knowledge of the extinction group. Um, and so this was a little, this was, you know, interesting to us. Um, we sort of wondered, is it, a, is it sort of a cognitive factor? What's mediating this effect? One of the first things we tried to do is say, do we see similar pattern in rodents? So often we go from rodents to humans, saying, you know, we see something in rodents, is it true in humans as well? And then how do we extend to uh, sort of typical human experience? Here, because we really want to understand the neurobiology of why this works, we, we ask the question, can we now see this effect in rodents as well? And we'll walk through this, but the answer is yes, we did. So in collaboration with Joe Ledoux, um, here we have extinction training in the extinction group, and novelty facility extinction group, and here we have less evidence of threat recovery if they underwent novelty facilitated extinction. Um, and I'll tell you that you know, one of the things we're wondering now is why is this happening? What is it about introducing this simple um, neutral stimulus during this sort of exposure technique, this extinction technique that is uh, making that type of learning more effective. Um, and what we don't know yet, and this is where we're going, and this is why it's so important to have the rodent model as well, is we don't know if it's doing something like targeting the reconsolidation process and actually changing the nature of the memory, or is it actually strengthening the extinction learning, essentially, essentally augmenting the ventral medial prefrontal cortex uh, amygdala circuitry and making the extinction learning more effective. That we don't know yet. Oh, but this was work by Joey Dunsmore again, uh, and also Vin Capisi, who uh, is on the job market. So just to summarize, um, what I've talked about today is you know, that extinction and cognitive emotional regulation are effective, clinically relevant techniques to control maladaptive threat responses. But we know that these threat reactions are susceptible to relapse following stress, the passage of time, changes in context, uh, and we think this may be linked to some of the, um, uh, some of the, the uh, lack of efficiency in these uh, type of techniques in clinical practice for some individuals. Um, and, we, and so our goal here is to look for better techniques. By targeting <laughs> reconsolidation, we can prevent the, um, this relapse, by we think by reducing dependence on the prefrontal inhibitory mechanism, essentially updating the memory itself. But we know so far that success is subject to a number of boundary conditions, uh, and clinical tra translation has been somewhat difficult. One of the boundary conditions being that when you have highly intense threats, you make it generalized memory that make it, uh, memories that may make it hard to target specific uh, memory formation. 
By special controllability, when we use this technique, we can enhance the pers persistent control of threat by <coughs> augmenting prefrontal inhibitory mechanisms. And right now in the laboratory, we're trying to say, how far can we push that? Can we actually do it better than the technique I showed you here? And how does it extend to other type of threat reactions um, beyond this simple threat learning? And finally, with novelty for social extinction, we can enhance persistent threat control, uh, but we just we don't yet know the mechanisms, and that's something uh, we're actively investigating. So finally, just to sum up, I, I hope I've convinced you that animal models of threat conditioning provide a basis for understanding human fear learning and human threat processing, and potentially also some of the mechanisms involved in uh, anxiety and fear-related disorders. Uh, but I think it's very important that we keep in mind that the complex human social environment and the symbolic means of communication that we have lead to greater flexibility in threat learning in humans than other species. And this, of course, uh, it can both be an advantage and a disadvantage when we're trying to target, um, target uh, maladaptive threat responses. Um, and that the flexibility of human threat learning can provide unique challenges in translating research from animal models to the treatment of clinical disorders. So I'd like to end by thanking um, the people that paid for this work, uh, the people that did and inspired this work. Uh, once again, the Simon family, the award committee, uh, the New York County Medicine, and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Liz, thank you for that really uh, elegant uh, presentation, though really uh, very rigorous and uh, uh, insightful sort of neuroscience. Um, it's it's uh, well. The fir my first well, first let me just mention that um, we're doing something a little bit different this year. Uh, after 